Good morning. Welcome to Earl Street. It's a beautiful Sunday morning, and we are so glad that you have chosen to come and worship with us this morning. We want to extend a very special welcome to those of you that are first-time guests with us. And if you are a first-time guest, we would invite you to look in the pew pocket in front of you. There are guest cards located there. We would encourage you to take one of those guest cards out to fill it out and then drop it in the offering plate when it's passed later on this morning in the service. We are just so glad that you have chosen to worship with us this morning. Today is the last day to sign up to play basketball. So if you or your child or your grandchild are interested in playing, you need to make sure you get signed up this morning while you're here at church or you visit our website and sign up online. The online registration will be open until midnight tonight. So make sure you get signed up while you're here at church or you take care of it before midnight tonight when the registration closes out. It's also the last day to sign up to play in our golf tournament, which will be next Saturday. The golf tournament will benefit a house on Beekman, which is one of our ministry partners in the Bronx of New York City. If you are interested in playing golf, if you'll see Lucy or see Mark Acock, either one of them can sign you up this morning, but you do need to sign up today if you want to play golf next Saturday. Also next Saturday morning, we'll be having our, our prayer breakfast for the fall. It'll start at 9 o'clock down in the fellowship hall. We'll have a wonderful buffet breakfast. I promise you, you can't, it would rival any breakfast here in Greenville. You want to come to that, but more importantly, we'll be spending time in prayer following the prayer breakfast. And our emphasis for this Saturday is going to be on missions. So we'll be gathering for a time of prayer for missions after we have our breakfast together. So I encourage you to come and join us Saturday morning at 9 o'clock here in the fellowship hall. On October the 26th, which is a Thursday, not this coming Thursday, but the next, we'll be having our senior adult retreat. It's going to be taking place at the Shy House out on the uh, campus of Furman University. The house is beautiful. The location is gorgeous. We have got three wonderful teachers that are going to be leading us, and it's going to be a great opportunity for senior adults to gather together for that one day. The cost is $15. That covers your materials and your lunch for that day. And we would love to have you come and join us, but we need you to sign up so that we can adequately plan. There are sign-up sheets located on bulletin boards around the church, as well as in the vestibule and on, in the church office. And if you can't find a sign-up sheet, you can always let Chuck know, or you can call the church office and let us know, and we will be glad to add your name to that list. Then, on Sunday, October the 29th, we're going to be having Senior Adult Sunday. That is the Sunday when our senior adult choir will lead us in our music. We will have a, um, several of our retired ministers who will be bringing the message that morning. And then following the 1030 worship service, we'll be having a luncheon just for senior adults down in the fellowship hall. It will be a free catered luncheon, but we need to know if you're planning to attend so we can get an accurate count to the caterer. So you can sign up anytime through next Sunday. Again, there are sign-up sheets for that located on the bulletin boards and in um, the vestibule, but don't wait till next Sunday. If you know you're going to be coming to the senior adult lunch and sign up today, don't put it off to next week. You don't know what next week holds. If you're planning on coming to the senior adult retreat or to the senior adult lunch, and make sure you get your name on those sign up sheets today. For more information, you can see Chuck, he can help you with that. And last but not least, we are continuing to sell tickets for barbecue plates that will be sold at our missions marketplace. That's a church-wide event that will be taking place um, November the 10th and the 11th. It will also be down in the Fellowship Hall. The Marketplace is an opportunity for you to purchase handmade crafts, handmade items, and there will be jellies and jams and food items down there as well, too. All the proceeds go to support international missions. This is the season we're getting ready to go into. But also on that Saturday, we'll be selling barbecue plates. Steve Davis, who is one of our church members, is a barbecue master, and he will be doing the barbecue for that day. You can get a plate for $8. At the plate has barbecue, baked beans, coleslaw, and a drink and chips. And it's a wonderful way to spend your Saturday. Come have barbecue, um, visit the bazaar, the, the marketplace, purchase some items for your Christmas presents or for yourself, um, and know that the money that you're spending is going to support international missions opportunities around the world. So again, purchase your tickets this morning downstairs in the Fellowship Hall. They'll be selling them on Wednesday evenings and Sunday mornings. But again, if you're going to plan to come, go ahead and make that purchase this morning. Don't put it off. Now as we move into our time of worship, if you'll check your cell phones, make sure you have them on vibrate or on silent to help us minimize the distractions and interruptions as we worship together.
We have come to affirm our historic faith. We worship the God of our mothers and fathers. We have come to remember God's faithfulness to us. And to respond in thanksgiving to the mighty works of God in our lives. We have come to affirm our trust in the God of all futures. To, to whose name be blessing and honor, glory and power, forever and ever. Amen. Good morning to everybody. I see your smiling faces, and it's such a wonderful day to be here at church with your friends and all your family. I'm going to tell you a story. A long, long time ago, there was this place that was called Corinth, and it's still in the world today. It's way across the ocean. And Paul was a very special apostle which meant he was a follower of Jesus. And Paul went to Corinth to work. He was the man who started new churches and he told people about Jesus. He was very good at what he did. He did a very good job in helping the church at Corinth to grow. 
Later on, there was a man who also did the same thing Paul did. His name was Apollos, and he started some new churches and told people about Jesus so they could believe in Jesus also. Now, since that time, and this has been many years ago, but since this time, there have been a lot of people who have started new churches and helped people to know about Jesus. I'm going to show you a picture. I want you to look at these people in here. I'm going to start over here. What do you notice about this? Mm. Do, you, do you see our, build, our church building? Nope, but you're right. This is our church, even though we don't see a church building because it's the people that are the church. This is an old picture, isn't it? Long time ago. These were members of our church. Some of these, most of these people, I get, well, there may be some of the little tiny ones that might still be alive now, but most of these people have died and gone on to heaven. Now, some of these people were Sunday school teachers, just like you have Sunday school teachers. Some of them sang or they played music in the church. And there was one man who was their pastor, just like Mr. Stephen is our pastor and Mr. Chuck is our associate pastor. Well, all of these jobs were real big jobs and they were important jobs. We also remember that there are people in this picture who would spend their time praying for each other. Many of the ladies that you see in this picture would cook food and then take it to people who were sick. And some of the men in here, the strong men, would build the floors and the walls in this building that we see today. None of these jobs that these people did were more important than the other jobs because they each did what they were able to do so that the church would grow. Now, we come to today. You and I are a lot like Paul and a lot like Apollos. We should each do what we can to help our church grow. And one day when you get all grown up and when I am very old, there are going to be some children who are probably going to look at some pictures of us. And they're going to remember the things that we did to help our church grow. And I want you girls to think about some things you can do to help our church grow. Okay? All right. Now, I do want you to remember, though, that it's not just us that are helping the church grow, but it wouldn't grow if it weren't for God because God is who really makes a church grow. So we should be thankful to God for our church and remember that no one person is better than another person or more important than another person in the work that they do for God. This is what would be pleasing to God. So let's bow our heads and have our prayer. Dear God, we thank you so so very much for this church that we love so much. We thank you for the people who have used their gifts and talents that you have given them to help our church grow through the years. Show us what we can do to help it continue to be a place where we can worship and learn about you, love each other, and to tell other people about Jesus. We pray this in your most precious and holy name. Aren't they precious? I'm Mary Arrowwood, and my husband Glenn and I have the privilege and the good fortune of working with Operation Christmas Child all year long. And now it is time for you all to start helping us work with Operation Christmas Child. Downstairs in the Fellowship Hall, you will find the shoe boxes and the Salvation Dolls. 
take as many shoe boxes as you think you can fill and bring them back. Include hygiene items, a wow item, such as a sweet baby doll or a volleyball that is flattened and has rubber bands around it with a pump because we can't put those big balls in, but we can the flattened ones. Uh, have other things such as school supplies, a stuffed animal, flip-flops, puzzles, coloring books, crayons, anything you think children would like. On Sunday, November 5th, we shall have our yearly soup lunch combined with our packing party, and we invite each one of you to come and help us pack shoe boxes. Hopefully you can bring some soup, at least part of you. It will be after our worship service that day that we have this. There are a few changes to the boxes this year, however. Do not, do not include candy nor toothpaste. We cannot have candy or toothpaste. There has been a problem in customs with some of the countries that will not allow our shoe boxes to go through because of those. Another change is the amount of money requested to help pay with each box. This includes the price for shipping, customs, inspections, and the items that Samaritan's Purse includes, such as the printed info about Jesus Christ, the booklet, The Greatest Journey, and Bibles, which are in the language of the people who get them. Our goal this year is 600. That was our goal last year, and we didn't quite make it, so I'm excited. Hopefully this year we're going to get to make that goal. Operation Christmas Child has reached 150 countries and territories so far. Last year we went to 104 countries. It changes each year. The main thing that we do, that you do, that anyone do, does, is pray over the box and pray for each child who will receive that particular box. These boxes are a tangible way to demonstrate God's love and to let the children know that they are loved. For many of these children, it will be the first and only gift they ever receive. It's amazing to see children get excited over toothbrushes rather than having to share with six to ten different people the same toothbrush. If you're willing to help in a processing center where cartons of thousands of boxes are packed, we invite you to join us on November 30th to go to Charlotte. We will work in that processing center from 10 o'clock in the morning until 2 o'clock in the afternoon. If you're interested in that or you have any questions or anything concerning Operation Christmas Child, please give me a call or email me. My phone number and email address are in this week's homepage. So if you have any questions, please let me know. If you want to go to Charlotte, let me know as soon as possible. We have room for 20 people. Once again, please remember to shop and pray as you shop, to pack it, put the rubber bands around it and the name tag on it. <coughs> Let's bow in prayer. Oh, I forgot to mention my necklace. This I got at an international uh, conference that we went to. It has many of the different states and countries that help with Operation Christmas Child. Some of these are receiving countries. Let's bow in prayer. Our Father and our God, we may not be able to go to these different countries, but you give us the opportunity to send things to these different countries so that children can know they're loved, so that they can know all about you, and they in turn can tell their family and friends all about you so that the gospel can be shared all over the world. In Christ's name, amen. And just a side note, with all the boxes that were sent last year, if we had sent one to every child in Africa that we had, we still would not have had enough boxes. That's just one place. So do pack as many as you can. Thank you.
Good morning. Let's go to our Lord in prayer. Dear Father, at this time of offering, we give as much of our lives and ourselves to you as we know how, as much as our hearts and our energy and our faith will permit. We give for many reasons, Lord, but mostly because we are thankful. From where we dwell in your comfort, we ask for joy and comfort for so many around us who are hurting. For those still in the face of disaster in recent weeks, from Puerto Rico and Florida and Texas to Las Vegas and California. From here at home, where we know so many suffering with illness and loss, to all around the nation and the world, where fear and confusion and poverty and spirit can give way to unity and love through the simplest kindness. Healing and goodwill are the fruits of your spirit in us, and we pray that those fruits will be our real offering to you today. Only if you bless our efforts, only if we trust you, and please strengthen our faith. Amen.
The scripture reading this morning is taken from the letter of Paul to the Corinthians, <clears throat> 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 5 through 9. And as I read these words of scripture, I invite you to listen for God's word for you and for us all. What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you came to believe as the Lord assigned to each. I planted... Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. The one who plants and the one who waters have a common purpose, and each will receive wages according to the labor of each. For we are God's servants, working together. You are God's field, God's building. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As you might have noticed, certain professions seem to attract people with big egos. And I happen to be in one of those professions. <laughs> All preachers have egos. I don't care what they say. Some are just better at smoother in knowing how to disguise them. Um, I'm in one of those professions. You may be in one of those professions. Paul was in one of those professions. And if you've done even a casual reading of some of Paul's writings, you realize that not even Paul could disguise his ego completely. According to Acts chapter 18, Paul was the one who established the church in Corinth. He was the one who first brought the gospel there. He worked there a year and a half on his second mission trip somewhere around A.D. 50. Not long after he established the church and worked there 18 months, he moved on to another place. And not long after he left, he received word that the church in Corinth was already dividing. I know it will seem strange to you, but sometimes churches divide <laughs> over um, issues that sometimes are are not all that important, and sometimes over issues that are. So Paul wrote this letter that we now call 1 Corinthians to address those issues that he had heard about, those issues that were threatening the unity and harmony and vitality of the congregation there. The church was divided over moral and ethical issues. There were worship wars, even back then. Some wanted a different style of worship than others. There were theological issues and some even legal issues that were causing the Corinthians to choose sides and draw lines. But not only were they dividing over those kinds of issues, they were also dividing over personalities. Get this, everybody had a favorite preacher. As early as chapter 1, we realized this was a big deal in the church in Corinth because right off the bat, at the very beginning of this letter, Paul identifies the camps that existed in the Corinthian church. Some were loyal to Paul, who after all was the founding pastor of the church, but some who might have appreciated Paul might have been glad to see him leave. My daddy used to say it's better to leave than when they want you to stay than to stay when they want you to leave. I got several amens in the 915 service over that, and I took the hint. Well, when Paul left, some wanted him to stay, others wanted him to leave. And while some in the church remained loyal to Paul even after he left, Others transferred their loyalty to Paul's successor, Apollos. And others transferred their loyalty to Cephas, another name for Peter. And then there were some who insisted that their loyalty was to Christ. And we're not sure whether that last group was just the spiritually superior group that said, well, we belong to Christ, or whether it was their way of really trying to keep the church focused on Jesus rather than on human personalities. Well, in chapter 1, verses 12 and 13, Paul acknowledged these divisions and then asked the question, what, is Christ divided? The church is the body of Christ. So when you divide, what, does that mean that Christ is divided? 
Were you baptized in my name, Paul asked? Was I the one crucified for you, Paul asked? This reminds me of what Sylvia sometimes says to me when I start to think I'm more important to the church than I really am. Jesus died for the church. You don't have to. <laughs> she also sometimes quotes from one of Jim Wooten's famous sermons. Jim preached a sermon when he was pastor here on John the Baptist, and the title of the sermon was The Savior's Pavior. And pavior apparently is an old English word that means one who paves the road, paves the way for the next person. And he was the point of the sermon was John the Baptist was the Savior's pavior. Well, sometimes when Sylvia thinks that I have an inflated view of myself, she will say, you're not their Savior, you're not even their pavior. <laughs> If Paul had been married, maybe he wouldn't have had such a big ego. <laughs> Pastors come and they go. Um, I think about that every time I sit in the conference room in our church and look at the photos of all the pastors of our church that we're celebrating our 95th anniversary as a church. We have pictures of every pastor who's ever served here from the very beginning in 1922. Nobody remembers all of them. Some of us might remember some of them. Some of us might be trying to forget some of them. Every one of them was admired by some and criticized by others. Some were better preachers than others. Some were better pastors than others. Some had the gift of evangelism. Some did not. Some helped the church advance while others helped the church heal and stabilize. Some were strong leaders congregationally and others were better one-on-one -on -one as counselors. Some were scholarly and were better teachers while others weren't all that scholarly but they could do a wonderful funeral. <laughs> Some stayed 20 years. Jim Wooten stayed 21, the longest of all, and some were here only a year or two. But as Frank Tedders, our history team leader, will tell us, every one of them made a contribution. Our pastors, as the Lord has assigned to each his task. Earl Street had four pastors in its first decade. The founding pastor, J. Furman Moore had actively supported the Baptist Churches of South Carolina as a state convention worker. That experience made him an ideal person to help plant and nurture this newborn church. Dr. Ellis A. Fuller served Earl Street for about two years before leaving to accept a call from First Baptist Church of Atlanta, also becoming president of the Home Mission Board. Dr. Fuller was highly regarded as an evangelist, a preacher, and a teacher. Earl Street's next two pastors, T. Baron Gibson and I. L. Yearby, each served here for about two years and left to accept calls from outside the state. Dr. William L. Ball served Earl Street from September 1932 until his retirement in October 1945 shepherding the church through the Great Depression and World War II with a positive spirit and a gift of encouragement. Reverend Nathan C. Brooks became Earl Street's next pastor in November 1946, serving for five years. During his tenure, the education building was built and Northgate Baptist Church was established. Dr. C. Earl Cooper became pastor in 1952 and served through 1959. Many churches flourished during the 1950s, but Earl Street was especially strong and vibrant. Dr. Cooper was a tall, imposing man with a powerful voice. More impressive still was his intellect, evident in his sermons and the articles he wrote for the church newsletter. Dr. Henry L. Anderson followed Dr. Cooper at Earl Street in 1960. Dr. Anderson was an able preacher whose engaging personality especially appealed to children. When Reverend w. w. Harold Killian came to Earl Street in 1966, he faced divisions left by the departure of his predecessor. 
his personality and his gifts were ideally matched to the situation. Reverend Kidian brought calm and steady leadership, warmth and compassion to the church, which he served for 20 years. Dr. James G. Wooten was called to Earl Street in 1987. Just as Harold Killian had been the right man to help the church heal, Jim Wooten was the right person to begin a new era of progress. During his 21-year pastorate, the church grew not only in numbers, but also in missions and ministries. It is as if the church was replanted, its soil renewed, so that God could grant another season of growth. Earl Street's previous 10 pastors all left their mark on the church. Some had more obvious impact than others, but all contributed to the history that has brought us to the present day. Some had different gifts than others, but all contributed. That is exactly the point Paul was writing to make to the young church in Corinth. And to drive that point home, he used two analogies. The first was an agricultural analogy, likening the church to a field. As the founding pastor, Paul was the one who had planted the church. He's the one who planted the seeds. But then he moved on, and he was followed by Apollos, who had different gifts and had a different role to play, one without the other, would have been incomplete, as good as Paul was. What good does it do to plant seeds if somebody doesn't come behind you and water them? Conversely, what good does it do to water seedless soil? So the one who planted, Paul said, deserves no credit, neither does the one who watered. Pastors can plant seeds and water the soil, but they can't make the plants grow. That's something only God can do. The one who plants and the one who waters, Paul said, are equal in the eyes of God. And both will receive what is due them. Paul reminded the Corinthians and all of us that when we are working in the church, we are not just working alone. We are not just working with each other. But we are working with God. We are God's fellow workers. God is working with us. We are working with God. When we plant the seeds and use the gifts God has given us, we can be assured that we are not in this by ourselves. We can trust God to take the gifts we give and to do what only God can do with them. We are God's fellow workers. So Paul said, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. We are God's field. But the second analogy he used was that of a building. Paul said we are not only God's field, but we are God's building. This is an image which Paul develops further in the verses that follow, and we will come back to those verses next week as we look at verses 10 through 17. But for now, it is enough for us to notice that again, just as God is the one who makes the plants grow, God is the one who builds the building. Not the physical structure with bricks and mortar, but the spiritual building, the spiritual house that God is building with us as living stones. Just as we are God's field as the church, we are God's building. On groundbreaking day, we wrote our names on stones and laid them in the ground. And these stones represented the lives we live, and the gifts we give. Not long from now, not very long at all, no one will even remember that those stones are there, let alone whose names are on them. And that's not just true of the pastors who have come and gone, that's true of all the members of this church throughout its 95-year history. The people who helped build this church you don't know any of their names. I don't. They are written down somewhere, but you don't know them. You don't remember. They made their contribution, and their contribution was soon forgotten by everybody else except God. And that is as it should be. That is how God designed it to be. The church is not about us. 
when it is all said and done, when the history of God's church is written, we can sow the seeds, we can water them, but we cannot make the plants grow. We can offer our living stones with our names and unique gifts on them, but we cannot build this church. Because there's going to come a day in the not too distant future when our names will fade into oblivion and there will be only one name, only one name that matters. It's a name that is above every name. When our stones are covered up and buried in the ground, only one stone will remain visible, the cornerstone, Jesus himself. This church that God is building is infinitely bigger than anything we could build ourselves. And all of this is by design. Because God loves us and because every living stone is precious to God, God has found a way to involve all of us in something that is eternal, something that really matters, something that will outlive and outlast us. A lot of what I have read in recent days about the so-called millennial generation is that they don't have any kind of loyalty to institutions like people in my generation did. And if they ever start to think of the church as an institution, they will not find a lot of value in it. But if they can ever begin to see, and if we can ever begin to claim, that the church is not an institution, it is not a building, it's not an organization. The church is the field in which God is working. Everybody in here wants to come to the end of your life and be able to say, I gave my life to something that mattered. Everybody in here wants to be able to say that. I gave my life to something that will outlive and outlast myself. And you have to make your own decisions about that, but I can tell you the decision I've made is that as long as God gives me breath, this church is what I intend to give my life to. And that's because God is doing something here that is far greater than anything we could imagine. I've thought about that so much this weekend. This afternoon at 2 o'clock, I will be attending the funeral of Ernest Carswell, who was the pastor at Taylor's First Baptist for 30 years or more. Dr. Carswell, when he retired, worshipped here every Sunday here at Earl Street. Of all the churches he could have gone to, he worshipped here. And there's no way for me to tell you what a tremendous encouragement he was to me. I revered him. And a lot of pastors in my generation looked up to him as the model of what a pastor should be. And the people at Taylor's revered him too. And today we will honor his memory as we worship God in that church that he helped to build. But as hard as it is for me to imagine and as strong as his contribution was, there will come a day when nobody will recognize his name. Nobody will remember. It'll be in a history somewhere. Somebody will read about it. But that is the way Dr. Carswell would have wanted it. From a human standpoint, there are a lot of heroes in the past and in the present of this church. And there will be a lot of heroes in the future of our church. And our prayer is, as the choir has sung, that those who come behind us will find that we were faithful. Just as we who have come behind our ancestors have found that they were faithful. We are a part of a God-sized kingdom. We are a part of something eternal. We are a part of something infinite. And even if, God forbid, there comes a day when the doors of this 
particular local church are closed, this church will have made an eternal contribution to a kingdom that is bigger than anything we can imagine. Whatever is accomplished, we must be careful to give credit where credit is due. In my role in the church as pastor, I'm in a unique position to be able to see some things that not everybody gets to see. I'm in a position to be able to see many of you doing things behind the scenes that nobody sees you doing. People who make such a difference in the life of this church are not always the people whose names or faces you would recognize. They're not, all, they're not always the people on the stage. Most people don't even know who they are or what they do. Most people will never know how much they have given, the ministry they have offered, the people they brought to faith in Christ, the bridges they have built, to strengthen and solidify relationships, the love they've shared, the fellowship they've fostered, the ministries they've offered, the prayers they've prayed. Their names aren't going to appear on any plaques anywhere that I know of. There aren't going to be any buildings named for them either. Most of the people who have made this church and are making this church what it is have done it in relative obscurity. Those who came before us came and they went, they made their contributions and they passed away. They come and they go and so will we. And I just want to be sure that once we have come and we have gone we were faithful in investing in something that will outlast us. Just as sure as some of us might plant seeds in the fertile soil of God's kingdom, others will come behind us and water the seeds we have planted. But only God can make the church grow. We may be living stones, but we are God's building. And if we are going to give credit where credit is due, then God and God alone deserves the glory. From the mighty to the small, the glory in them all is God's and God's alone. God and God alone reveals the truth of all we call unknown <clears throat> and all the best and worst of man won't change the master's plan it's God's and God's alone God and God Everything that lives reserve its truest praise for God and God alone. God and 
and God alone will be the joy of our eternal home. He will be our one desire, our hearts will never tire of God and God alone. God and God alone is fit to take the universe's throne. Let everything that lives reserve its truest praise. Everything that lives reserve its truest praise for God and God. Let everything that lives reserve its truest praise. something that matters, then it's God and God alone revealed to us in Jesus Christ. Give your life to him. Trust him to do for you what you can't do for yourself. Today I invite you to place your trust in Christ, but more than that, to invest your life in this eternal kingdom that we call the church. And if you're led today to invest in this local expression of God's universal church, then we would love to welcome you into our family of faith. It could be that the Spirit is leading you to respond in some other way, to come forward and kneel or in some other way. However the Spirit leads you to respond, I will be here at the front to receive you as we stand to sing.
may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit be with you and abide with you and keep you this day and forevermore. Thank you.